We're in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 this morning, and we're continuing on with uh, what we have studied, and uh, we're going to just take our time leisurely sauntering through the book of 1 John. You know, when you describe people, uh, you describe them in a few ways. That you got to first find out male or female. Uh, that still matters in 2016, doesn't it? Uh, you got to find out where they are. Are they short or tall? That matters. Uh, are, are they young or old? Because uh, you know that, that that'll give you a key. Uh, is that person? Do they have you know white hair or dark hair? Let's find out. You can find out about their education. You start getting into what they know and what they've learned and their career. We get into that pretty quick, right? What, what do you do? What's your career? And then you start to get into the details like uh, their personality. Oh, this person is really joyful or this person is really quiet. You know, So you get into that. And then you get into their hobbies and find out what they love to do. But after that, after a few descriptors, you sort of you'd sort of know what a person's all about. You've, 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 uh, that's about all there is to us, you know? And uh, even the deepest of us, it's like uh, after a while, you find out just pretty much everything you want to know. After that, anything they tell you is probably too much information, right? And, and we can play some demure personality games sometimes that act mysterious and deep and all that and hide some secrets, but... Uh, we're really not all that deep when it really comes to it. We're, we may be complex, but that's just because we like to hide stuff. But uh, we're just humans. And when it comes down to it, we're just dirt, right? With, God, with God-like stuff on the inside. That's, that's what we are. Now, you, you compare us to Jesus and what John is trying to do when he writes his Gospel, and then he writes his three letters, and then he writes the Revelation, and John is attempting to convey the person of Jesus, and he's, he struggles. You and I would struggle when you really think about it, about Jesus. He's the son of Joseph, but not really. He's the son of Mary, but not really. He's uh, the, the son of David, but at the same time, the psalm says that he is David's God. So here's David, the king of Israel, a thousand years before Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and he's David's God, talking down to David. 33 years old, but he's eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end, which makes him, uh, as Melchizedek, the only other person who did this, a uh, person that has no traceable beginning and end. You can't, you can't find the beginning and the end of them. He's a helpless baby in a manger, but Colossians tells us that he's the creator of all things, visible and invisible. And so he, he's helpless in that manger, but at the same time, he's over all thrones and dominions and powers. He's over all of that. And all things not only were made by him, but they were made for him. He knows everything, but as a child... Luke tells us that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with man and God. He is fully favored by God, but he grows in favor with God. You getting a mental hernia yet? He feeds 5,000 with some bread and some fish, but he ends up at the end of the day exhausted. He's, he has to just go lie down. He has names he has titles. Let's just walk through some of his names and titles. This will take a couple of minutes. So, you ready to start writing? He is the Son. He is the Son of God. He is the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He is the firstborn of every creature. He is the Wonderful. He is the Counselor. He is the Mighty God. He is the Everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. To the Son, the Father said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. He is over all, God, blessed forever. Amen. He is the Savior. He is the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
He is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is I Am. He is Yahweh who was seen by Isaiah in chapter 6. And the angels flew over His head saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the resurrection and the life. He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. We're just getting started. He is the Almighty, which is and which was and which is to come. He is the beginning and the end. He has explained God. He is the Word. He is the image of the invisible God, the express image of His person. He is the brightness of God's glory. He is the wisdom of God. He is the power of God. He is the Son of Man. He is the prophet. He is a man of sorrows. He is cursed of God. He is the righteous. He is the servant of God. He is the Lamb of God. He is the bridegroom. He is the shepherd of the sheep. He is the way. He is the door of the sheep. He is the good shepherd. He is the chief shepherd. He is the root of Jesse. He is the branch. He is the vine. He is the true bread from heaven. He is the true light. He is the light of the world. He is the Son of righteousness. He is the rock. He is the builder. He is the chief cornerstone. He is the temple. He is the great high priest. He is the mediator. He is the intercessor. He is the advocate. He is the redeemer. He is the consolation of Israel. He is the truth. He is the faithful witness. He is the just one. He is the holy one of God. He is the head. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the head of every man. He is the head of all principality and power. He is the deliverer. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is Lord both of the living and the dead. He is Lord over all. He is the Messiah, the Prince. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Righteous Judge. He's the King. He's the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the Scepter out of Israel. He is the King's Son. He is David, their King. He is the King of Israel. He is the King of the Jews. He is the King over all the earth. He is the King of glory. He is faithful. He is holy and harmless. He is undefiled. He is separate. He is perfect. He's a little bit different from us, isn't He? Did you get all that down? Do we need to start over? He's different from us. Don't you think? So, so deep. When you look at us, it, you know we're such simple people. We do a few things. We think a few things. We say a few things. And that's about the extent of it. And our identity is, uh, you know... If you're a man here, you've got probably four hats. You're, you're a brother, you're a husband, you're a father, you're a son. If you're a woman here, you've probably got four hats. You're a sister, you're a mother, you're, you're a, a daughter, and, and, and so forth. You know, we've got our little hats that we wear, but when you look at Jesus, when you look at all the hats that He wears, it goes on for pages. Isn't that amazing? You remember a, a very long time ago, those of you who are very old, remember how we gave Carl Malone a nickname because he could put a ball in a hoop? And we gave him a nickname, the mailman, because he delivered, right? But big, strong, and he can put a ball in a hoop, okay? King of kings, Lord of lords, not so much. Jesus has dozens of other names in Scripture. And each of them is bursting with meaning and implication that He's the Most High God. He is the Ancient of Days. He's in charge of the universe. You point in any direction forever and ever and ever. And that the arrow never ends in the direction you point in any direction. And He is the King over that space and over whoever dwells in that. He's in charge of it all. And He's in charge of history. And He is in charge of the outcome of history. Okay? You may... We, we had some really exciting world events this week, didn't we? Some, some really big stuff. And you know what? He is in charge of the outcome of world events. 
He's everything. So you try to describe Him in human language. And John does what he can. You know, when when John writes the Revelation, the last book in our Bible, he uses words like a lot. He says, it was like this, it was like that. Because that's the best you can do when you're describing something that will blow your mind, right? And John is trying to convey something about Jesus in the book of 1 John. And we're going to be looking both in the book of 1 John, the letter of John, and also the Gospel of John this morning. So the first thing John calls Jesus in 1 John 1.1, let's read that because he calls Him a what? We saw that last week. He doesn't call Jesus a he. He calls Him a what? Because there's, there's more to what than he. Okay, you, you say, oh, there's him. Okay, now you've got to describe him a bunch. But the word what is bigger. It, des- it describes more. So John describes this package called the Son of God in John, 1 John 1.1. 1, 1, what was from the beginning? And the what, we're going to find out who that is. What we have heard what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the Word of Life. You notice the Word of Life is a person. It's a capitalized title. A descriptor of Jesus. And John 1.4, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 4 says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So, we're, let's talk about life today. And, and uh, first thing we're going to do, if you've got your sermon notes in front of you, we're going to de- define what that word life is. In every case that John uses the word life in, in all of his writings, he uses the word zoe. We get our word protozoa or zoo or zoology from that word. Uh, zoe means life. And it uses... Uh, uh, the Bible uses the word zoe in different ways. The first way it uses it is in regard to living things. Plants, animals, and people have life in them. If you don't have life, then they bury you. Okay, So uh, the first thing it is is that you are alive and a definition of life being you are burning fuel. Okay, That's the opposite of dead. That's the first definition. Okay, the, the second definition of life that Scripture uses it is in terms of lifespan. So you have what is called your life. What are you going to do with your life? You know, you've, you've had this much time. And, and so it, uh, the second definition of time is this how, the, how long you live. From birth to death, that is called your life. Okay? And, and James calls this span of time called our life, he calls it a vapor. A little puff of steam off of a pot. That's how long our life is. Have you noticed that? Uh, and those of you who have lived a very long time, have you noticed that just like five minutes ago you were in high school and now you're starting to make plans uh, like pre-planning for your burial, right? It, it's like, how did that happen? Just yesterday, I, was, I could leap tall buildings and now I just I sit around, you know? How did that happen? Well, it's because our life span is short. The third definition, as John uses it most of the time, life is all of the blessings of being in a relationship with God. In other words, this is the life, right? And so... The, the third definition is what's most important, is that life is, is the blessing of being in a relationship with God. Jesus is the life because He's God. And Jesus gives people this life. And if you believe in Jesus, then you are given eternal life so that whoever believes can have life and to have it abundantly. John chapter 8. And this is eternal life. Uh, Whenever a person believes in Jesus, you have life, and that life begins, and it goes on and on and on. 
And it gets better and better as you go along. Because the first time, the, the very moment you believe in Christ, it's like, oh, well, that's great. Now I'm forgiven and I have a relationship with God. But then you start to appreciate everything that there is in this life and all of the blessings that God has given us. And you go, wow, this is better and better and better. Are you serious? I finally am forgiven of all of my sins, past, present, and future. That's a great life. Really? I get to live forever with Jesus? That's a good life, right? And, and so you begin to enjoy the life that Jesus has given to us. So when John describes Him in verse 1 as the Word of life, he's, he's talking about the life that you have in your heart and in your life when Jesus enters in. Now, John is very clear. He's very exclusive about this. And he says in chapter 3 of, of the Gospel of John, if you have the Son, you have life. If you do not have the Son, you do not have life, but the wrath of God abides in you. And so, it's either or. Do you want to have eternal life? Do you want to have the blessed life of relating to God? You have to come to Jesus, the Son. He is the source of life. And that's why John calls Him the Word of Life. Alright, so if you will go back a few books to the Gospel of John, let's walk through this a little bit. Let's do a little survey of the Gospel of John and talk about Jesus, the Word of Life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. In the first four books in the New Testament. Hope you can find it real quick there. Well, let's just uh, start marking up our Bibles and talk about Jesus being the life. You see it first in John 1.4. Notice, John is writing about Jesus. John is the disciple that was closest to Jesus. In fact, he was the closest human to, ever to Jesus. And so, in verse 4, John 1.4, in Him was life, and the life was the light of of men. And, and it's really important to understand the alternative here. Outside of him, there is no life. Okay? You, you have to be really clear about them. Uh, this. He is life, and he, in him is life. The stuff that is the whole blessing of being in a relationship with God, Jesus has it. Okay? Jesus has this life, and he shares it with people. This answers the question then, where do I go to have spiritual life? To whom do I turn? We have only one person in all the universe who can give us this life. Just one single person. We go to John chapter 3, if you'll flip pages with me. John 3, verses 14, starting in 14. Jesus gives a little account back to Moses and the snakes who bit people in the wilderness. And you remember that when the snakes were biting people, Moses put up a pole in the middle of camp with a, a brass snake on the top of it. And whoever looked at that snake would live and not die from their snake bite. Right? Remember that? Okay, John 3.14 As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in Him will, will, in, will in Him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so, just as in Moses' day, you would look at the snake on the pole and say, I am healed from my snake bite. Now, in our day, God has raised up Jesus on the cross so that whoever believes in Him will have that zoe, that life that God gives. So we have to go to Jesus for this special kind of life. And now we find out that we have to completely believe in Him for this special kind of life. Go with me to John chapter 4, verse 14. 
And now Jesus is talking to a, a woman who is a, a Samaritan woman. They were considered to be low people. Sort of the trashy kind of people in that region. And Jesus is talking to this woman and He says, verse 14, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And again, Jesus is saying to this woman, you, you can drink from this well. They were sitting by a well at the time. He says, you can drink from this well, you'll be thirsty soon. But you drink from what I give you, you will have a well of water springing up and it will be life forever. Eternal life. Flip another page to John chapter 5, verse 18. I will read a little bit. Let me give you a little context here. Jesus had just healed a man who had been paralyzed and sitting next to a pool of water. And it was believed at this pool of water that if you could jump in when the water was bubbling, then you would be healed. But for 32 years, he had sat by that pool and had never successfully jumped in the water because his body would just not obey him when he wanted to get in to that water. And so there he sat for all those years. Jesus comes along and heals him. And the man rolls up his, his sleeping mat and walks away. And so the, the Pharisees got really excited about Jesus healing this man because he did it on Saturday. And so they said, hey, what are you doing? Healing a guy on Saturday. You're not supposed to do that. No nice stuff on Saturday. Don't you know that? And so they came to him and he starts to talk to the Jewish leaders. In verse 18, John 5.18, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. You might want to underline that. Equal with God. Right? Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly. You remember what that means? In in the original language it is, Amen, Amen. I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself is doing, and the Father will show Him greater works than these so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, that's the word of the day, life, even so the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. We go on. For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent them. Amen, amen, I say to you, he who hears My Word and believes Him who sent Me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. Isn't that awesome what he is saying? So the Jewish leaders did not like it because he healed on the Saturday. Jesus used it as an opportunity to talk about life. He says, let's talk about life. Specifically, that the Father, God the Father, is the source of life and and has made also the Son the source of life. So that now Jesus is the source of life. And now, notice that Jesus sovereignly gives life to whom He wishes. You understand that if you have believed in Christ, good for you, and we praise God that you have, but you also understand that it was the sovereign choice of Jesus to give you that life. Right? That He is the one who decides whom gets life. Well, how can the Son make that decision to to give life to whom He chooses? Because the Father also, it says, has given the Son all judgment, according to verse 22. So that now the Son has all of the volition, all of the 
the decision-making authority in the universe is compacted in God the Son, Jesus. And He chooses who gets life. Amazing, isn't it? That what, what we're talking about is then that Jesus is the sovereign God. And Jesus is the sovereign God who has in His ability the authority to say, I give you life. I choose to give you life. Well, we go on in chapter 5, we stay in that same chapter, and if you go down to verse 39, we have more about Jesus. This is the same conversation that Jesus is having with the Jewish leaders. And Jesus said to the proud teachers, well, you guys are really adept at learning Scripture, but you have a problem. Verse 39, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about Me. And you are unwilling to come to Me so that you may have life. So He's saying to these proud religious teachers who knew the law of Moses backward and forward, He says, you know, you you guys really do have a lot of skill studying the Scripture. You have looked and looked and looked at Scripture your whole life. But the irony is, is that the Scripture, the Old Testament, talks about Jesus. And they missed it. They missed that part. And they were unwilling to come to Him to have life. Well, here's a hard heart, isn't it? That looks directly at Jesus and refuses the life He has to offer. Imagine that, that they have looked at a man who was paralyzed for over 30 years and he's got his bedroll tucked under his arm and he's walking. And they said, hey, 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 who healed you? And he said, well, that man right there. Well, he's bad because he did it on a Sabbath, right? And instead of saying, wow, here's somebody who healed a guy that was paralyzed for decades, they were, they were all caught up on the fact that it was Saturday. And they could not see Jesus in Scripture. And He is the One who gives life. And you notice that He says, your, your problem is that you could have come and had life but you refused to have life. Well, let's flip over to chapter 6 in the Gospel of John. And let's look at verse 26. And, and this is a, a rather long passage, but it, it has so much in here. Uh, let me tell you what's going on. Jesus has just fed 5,000 people with bread and fish. Okay, He made a, a, a miracle and and shared the, the bread and fish with everybody. The next day, the crowd comes again because they're a free lunch crowd. It's like, oh, uh, another buffet. Let's feed us again, Jesus. And Jesus said, well, you know, the problem is that you've, you're coming for the wrong reason. You're coming for lunch, and I've got something better to give to you. Okay? So, in verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. Every time you see that word life, it sort of sticks out, doesn't it? Which the Son of Man will give to you, for on Him the Father has set His seal. Therefore they said to Him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? They're all into works hoarding. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He has sent. And, And you may want to really highlight that verse because when somebody says, how can I hoard my works and please God so I can get into heaven? How can I make a big long list? Jesus just tears up the list and He says, you want to know the work of God? Believe in the One that the Father has sent. Verse 29, then verse 30, So they said to Him, What then will you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? This is sort of a duh moment, isn't it? 24 hours before, He just fed 5,000 people. Is that enough of a sign? And they're asking for another Our fathers ate the manna from in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. 
Jesus then said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to Him, Lord, always give us this bread. Oh, what a, what a great thing if you had the life constantly. The bread of life out of heaven, right? So they said, oh, could you always give us this, this bread? And Jesus in verse 35 nails it down. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to Me will not hunger, and he who believes in Me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen Me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives Me will come to Me, and the one who comes to Me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do My own will, but but the will of Him who sent Me. This is the will of Him who sent Me, that of all He has given Me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. This is the will of My Father that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. And I Myself will raise Him up on the last day. You understand? And then we go to verse 47. Amen, amen, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may not eat, may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So what is Jesus saying? Saying he, God sent him down. He came down from heaven. He is the bread from heaven. He's better than the manna in the wilderness, isn't he? Far better. They had to gather that every day in order to eat and, and get by for 40 years. He's better than the manna from heaven. He's better than everything. He will give you life. He's that source. And Jesus turned that conversation to eternal food. Well, let's flip another page to John chapter 8. They are at a feast in Jerusalem in chapter 8. Uh, one of the annual feasts. And we notice in verse 12, John 8, 12, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows Me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. He will be blessed by God is what He's saying. You will, you will finally have your eyes open. You will finally be living. It's an amazing thing spiritually that we can live this life not knowing Jesus, not loving Him, not believing in Him, and we can be like zombies walking through this life, living with our heart beating, eating food, working, sleeping, moving around, and not be alive. Isn't that an amazing mystery? And then along comes Jesus and you meet Him and you believe Him and He gives you life. John chapter 10. We go a couple more pages over. John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus again is talking to the religious leaders and He tells them that He's the Good Shepherd that takes care of the sheep. How do we know that He's the Good Shepherd? As opposed to a bad shepherd. That's what He's talking about. I'm the Good Shepherd. Emphasis on the good because the Good Shepherd lays down His life for the sheep. You will look with me at verse 27. John 10, 27. My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and they follow Me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of My hand. My Father, who has given them to Me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father 
are one. Is that great? But it says, so it says I, in verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never, never perish. You notice that once He gives life to one of His sheep, sheep it can never be ungiven. That's good news, isn't it? Now look at verse 12. Chapter 12, verse 25. John 12, 25. Now here's a challenge to you and me. What are you going to do with Jesus? How are you going to respond to Jesus? Are, are you going to take the, the second definition of life, which is your lifespan, all that you do you know, from birth to death, are you going to take that life span that you have and hold it to yourself and say, no, Jesus, you can't have this life span of mine. I'm not going to let you have it. You can't have it. It's mine. Well, notice what happens in verse 25. John 12, 25. He who loves this life loses it. And who, he who hates his life in this world, will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves Me, he must follow Me. And where I am, there My servant will be also. If anyone serves Me, the Father will honor him. Isn't that amazing that, that Jesus gives us this challenge about our life and He says, okay, so you want to keep your lifespan and be in charge of it. You want to be the manager of your life. As, as that poem says, I am the captain of my fate, right? The, the manifesto. Uh, if you hold on to that life, actually, Jesus says, you will lose it. You can't keep it because uh, you eventually end up dying and it's gone. But if we follow this li- Jesus in this life and give this life over to Him, He not only gives us life, but we get to keep the life that Jesus gives us forever. You think that one through, Okay? Here's a, here's a deal. Here's your choice. You have a few decades of mixed delights in this world. And you get to manage your own life. I'm in charge, right? Or a quadrillion, billion, however, billion words you can add to it, years with Jesus. Which one is most worth it? To keep this life for a couple of decades or that life forever? Life eternal sounds pretty good, doesn't it? All right, John chapter 14. Now, here we are getting toward the end of the ministry of Jesus, and he is at the supper with his friends. Okay? The final supper. And Jesus says, I'm going away. And Thomas said, Well, how can we know the way? We don't know the way. You say you're leaving. We don't even know the way. So you're going to leave us and. We don't even know how to follow you. And Jesus said, I am the way, verse 6, John 14, 6. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through Me. Okay? So He is the life. And nobody gets the life unless they come to Jesus. We keep bumping into that whole exclusively Jesus thing all the way through this, don't we? Like uh, He's acting like He's the source of life or something, right? Yeah. You're starting to catch on. Chapter 17. Flip over to chapter 17 if you will. And now Jesus is about to be crucified and He is praying. He's praying for His people. 17.2 it says, Well, we start in verse 1. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up His eyes to heaven, He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son that the Son may may glorify You even as You gave Him authority over all flesh that to all whom You have given Him He may give eternal life. This is eternal life. That they may know You, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who have sent And now, you notice that not only is the Son of God sovereignly in charge of giving to whom He will, but you notice in verse uh, verse 2 that the, the ones who get life are the ones who have been given 
from the Father to the Son. So the, the Father is saying, well, I want to choose this person. I want this person to have life. So in John 6.44, it says, God grabs that person and draws that person over to the Son. It's almost like uh, when, our, when our children were small, their clothing was, any clothing from head to toe was a handle to grab, right? And so it's like grab, and now you've got complete control over this child and you can do whatever you want with them. Uh, you know, you got that fistful of their, of their clothing and it's like, let's go for a walk or whatever. And now what, what the father does is he says, I want that person to be, to have life in the son. I want the son to give that person life. Grab, and he grabs that person and he brings them over to the son and he says to the son, this person should have life. And the son says, great, life, you are saved. And that person ends up believing in Jesus. Why? Because the father and the son said so. They sovereignly said so. And the father is the one who does that. And you notice he defines spiritual life in verse 3. Look at it again in John 17. This is eternal life that they may know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You don't want to know what life is? Life is not knowing about God and not even having good theology about God. Life is knowing God. That is eternal life. Actually, personally knowing the Father and the Son. That is life. Well, what of the person who doesn't know the Father and the Son? Well, it's pretty clear what those verses are going to say as well, right? If I don't know the Father, I don't know the Son, you don't have life. It's very clear. Well, let's go over to John 20, verses 30 and 31. <clears throat> By this time, Jesus has r risen from the dead and He has been walking and talking with His friends again after He rose from the dead. And, he, and John ends this Gospel with a summary. John 20, verses 30 and 31. And this is the reason for the Gospel of John. Okay, This is great stuff. There's, John says in verse 30, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in His name. Okay, So John summarizes the Gospel of John. And he says, there is too much. I can't tell you everything about Jesus. He goes on in the next chapter to say, if I told you everything about Jesus, all the books in the world would not be able to contain them. So, he says, I've, I've written a selective bit of material so that you will read it and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you will have life. So, you take those 21 chapters of the Gospel of John and you look and you can be saved and you can have life just by reading the Gospel of John. And I pray you will. I pray you will. By believing, you can have life in His name. Well, we've just done a very small survey of the Gospel of John. Now if you could go with me please back to the letter of 1 John. Way back in the back of your Bible. Almost in the end. So John wrote in his letter, and he says, we, that is the apostles, have seen the what. We've seen this, this what. Jesus is more than a he. He's like a phenomenon. He's like, he's like a package of stuff. It, there's, it, there's just this what that is to Jesus. Okay, he, He's too big to describe. And so John says, we have seen the what. And we have looked at the what. And we have touched the what. And we have listened to the what. And what is what? It's the Word of life. 
Jesus is the Word of life. He's the source of life. He's the, the, the expression of a thought that brings life. The Word of life. Imagine that. Where If you had the power to tell somebody just with words, I'm going to give you a few words and you will live. And if I don't tell you these few words, you're dead. Okay? Would you listen carefully if somebody told you that? I'm going to give you five words and you need to listen carefully and they will live and you will live, right? Well, Jesus is those words. He is the word of life. <clears throat> Jesus is more than a he. He's he's infinitely so much more than just a guy. And you may have walked in here this morning thinking, well, Jesus is just a guy. He's like, you know, he's he's a created being that God made and okay, so he's got a better suit than me, but he's He's just a guy, right? And the answer is, no, He's not. He's eternal God. He's unique from us. He's the Son of God. He's equal with God. He is the source of life. He is the sovereign judge of all the universe. And when, when all final decisions have been made, guess who? One person makes all of the final decisions. And when you and I die, all of us will die. All of us will stand before the, the throne of Christ And who makes the decision of you go here, you go here, it is Jesus alone, right? He is the judge of everything. So He's more than just a guy. He is a what? As John describes Him, implying that all of this glory and majesty and love and wisdom and power and authority and infinite beauty, all of it, is in perfection in one person, the Word of life, and His name is Jesus. He's a what? The Word of life. The source of life. The giver of life. And the only exclusive source of life. Go somewhere else and try to find another source of life. It does not exist. It's not there. So, what are the advantages of this kind of life? This Life, life that we're talking about. If I come to Him in faith and I ask for Him to forgive me (coughs) and I believe in His ministry on the cross, what do I get? Well, let's make a list. You get reconciliation with God. Is that good? You get forgiveness of all your sins, past, present, future. You, You become a child of God. You are given all of the spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You become an heir of the kingdom of God. You get a seat in the new Jerusalem. You get to live with Jesus forever. You are included into Christ, which has a ton of benefits. You you have all of the power and the ministries of the Holy Spirit. You have finally, and this is most important, especially if you've lived this week, if you've been alive this week, you have the power to fight sin. Amen? Amen. If you are in Jesus, you have the power to fight sin. If you do not have the life, you do not have the power to fight sin. You're just in sin. And if you have Jesus, you have the power to live an obedient life. And if you have Jesus, you have become a new creation. We could go on. There are like 51 different things that Jesus does the moment we believe. The Word of life is Jesus. He is the one that John says, we've touched Him, we've heard Him, we've we've listened to Him. Jesus is the Word of life. And Jesus is the only source for life in the whole universe. Nowhere else to go. There is no other fountain from which you may drink and live. He alone. John 3.36. Let me give it to you. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Life is this. It is a completely close, all-consuming, ongoing, growing, permanent, and love relationship with the Father and the Son. Who would not want that? Right? Do you want to have this life? Do you want to have that life that Jesus gives? Do you want it? 
Have you asked for it? Have you come to God and said, I know now that I have not believed in Jesus. I know now that I have not placed all my faith in Him and His ministry on the cross and what He did for me in dying in my place. I know now that if I were to die right now, I would not have that life and I don't have that life. Well, I want to give it to you right now just by saying you can have that life just by saying this. I do believe that Jesus has taken all my sins on Himself on the cross. I ask You for this life. I realize I'm dead. Please give me this life. I know that Jesus is the only source. I know I can't go anywhere else but to Jesus to get this life. Please give me this life right now. If you ask Jesus for it, He will give you the life and He will give it to you gladly. Two things to take home. Really important. If you do not have the Son, you do not have life. And you can go nowhere else but to Jesus for the life. Do you understand? Are we clear on that? Those two things are very important. You can ask for that life right now and receive eternal life. And I pray you do. Let's pray. Father, Jesus alone is our Judge, our Creator, our God, our life, the Prince of Peace. He is the One who has become our substitute on the cross. He is the One who has paid all for us to be forgiven. He has taken Your wrath upon Himself. He has taken our wrath upon Himself. God, I pray, if anybody in this room right now doesn't have the life, doesn't know Jesus, doesn't know You, help them, Lord, to come to You exclusively to find that life right now. Lord, give us life. That life that goes on and on and on. Jesus alone is the Word of life. And we praise You for giving Him to us. Amen.